Hello and welcome to another sociology revision video from me, uh, Ben at All Sociology. This one today is going to be all about theories of stratification. And specifically what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at Marxism and functionism, because the main debate really is between Marxist and functionist views of stratification. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you. So hopefully you'll be able to see me now up in my top uh, little corner up there on my perch and you will be able to see the menu of today's episode. So it's episode 13. Uh, so if you want to go back and check out uh, some of my previous videos, please do. There's loads of them there on sort of key terms, the family, education, research methods. And I've just recently also done one on sort of like an introduction to stratification and differentiation. So if you want to go back and have a look at that one, I'd recommend definitely having a look at that intro to stratification differentiation video, uh, which is number 12, uh, before you watch this one, because you'll kind of need to know some of the main ideas before we go through them and apply theory to them. So what we're going to do today is have a look at the functionist view of stratification. So what do they say about it? We're also going to mention very briefly the new right, because they're also, <clears throat> excuse me, very similar to the functionist view, but uh, slightly different. So always worth knowing about. Then we'll have a look at the opposite, which is the Marxist, the opposite to the functionist and really the new right view, which is the Marxist view. We'll go through some of the kind of key terms. So again, I'm going to go through like 10 key terms that I would have covered in this video uh, to make sure that you've really got an understanding of what those things mean. And then at the end, we'll have a look at a nine mark exam question. Now, before we start this, just to say, make sure you've got yourself a tasty drink. I've got myself a, a coffee in my all sociology mug. So um, this will take about half an hour. And what you could do as you go through this is like just pause the video at different bits, make sure you understand things. And when we go for the exam question at the end, uh, have a look at that and maybe pause the video and have a go for yourself. So this is very much designed for um, GCSE Educast students, but it will work for anyone taking GCSEs or even A-levels, to be honest. But just be aware that when I go through the exam question at the end, that will be specific to GCSE Educast. Anyway, let's get uh, started in earnest and let's go through uh, what we need to go through today. So theories of stratification and overview. So I'm, in this slide, what I'm going to do is just take you through the basically the, the functionist view, the Marxist view, and also the feminist view as well, in just in terms of how they see society as being stratified. And just to remind you uh, from last video as well, stratification, what does it mean? It's the layering of people in a hierarchy or in a kind of ordering in society. So let's have a look at the functionist view first of all. So according to functionists, society, if you look at the um, the arrow going up on the on the sort of right hand side of that pyramid there. Society is basically stratified according to hard work, and hard work will get you rewards. Now, what do we mean by rewards? We mean money, status, wealth, income, property, those kind of things. Okay. So for functionists, what we've got is the people that end up doing the best in society are ultimately the people who work the hardest. And beneath the hardest workers, you've got the people who work hard. Beneath those, you've just got the workers, people who put a shift in, but perhaps don't do much else. And then beneath them, you've got people who are either not working or living in poverty. So according to functionists, the way that society is stratified is based on hard work and ultimately meritocracy. Now, again, if you remind yourself from uh, last video, what meritocracy means. It means everyone's got an equal chance of success. Everyone's got an equal chance of doing well, but it's ultimately the hard work that you put in that's going to get you rewards. Okay, so functionist views of stratification is very much based on meritocracy and hard work. I'm going to go through this with you in a little bit more detail in a moment, but let's just have a look at the Marxist view of stratification. So the Marxist view, and um, sorry, I was going to go back, sorry. By the way, it isn't necessarily like a four-tier uh, system for functions. It's not based on hardest workers, hard workers, workers and not working. That's just a way that I've split it up to show that there's differences in terms of how hard people do work. OK, so when we look at the, um, the the Marxist view, it's a very different view. First of all, it's just a two tier system and it's based on ultimately based on class. So you've got the, pro uh, the proletariat at the bottom occupying the majority of that kind of that strata because there's more people in the proletariat or the working class or the, um, or the labourers than there are in the top class, which is the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, or what you might refer to as the middle class or the owners of means of production as well. So for Marx, it's not about hard work, it's about ownership. Do you own property and buy property? What Marx is really talking about is things like factories, land, businesses, uh, anything you can basically make money off. Um, if you do, you'll be in the bourgeoisie. If you don't, you're going to be, you own nothing. And so you have to sell your labor, your work 
to the bourgeoisie in their factories and those kind of things. So the bourgeoisie are the owners of uh, what Marx called the means of production. Basically, he's talking about factories there and, and, and businesses. The proletariat, they don't own anything. It doesn't matter about how hard you work. It's all about what you own in uh, in a capitalist system, according to Marx. So that's the, the two main uh, sort of theories that we're going to focus on today. And that's just an overview. I'm also just going to briefly mention feminism. Feminism, I'm going to come to in a future video when I look at issues of, of gender as well. I'm going to kind of do feminism and gender as one because there's it's quite a simple system for feminists. It, clearly, for, for a feminist, they would believe that society is based on the structure of patriarchy with men at the top of the strata, owning, you know, owning necessarily, but having all of the power, control, dominance over women who are at the bottom of the power, uh, the uh, strata there. Now, obviously, with this one, we've got a more equal split. I know it doesn't perhaps look equal, but you've actually got a 50-50 split of men and women there. But men occupy that top position due to the power and control that they can they have and, and they can uh, wield over women. So that's a bit of a just a basic overview as to how these three different theories see stratification in society. So for functionists, basically, it's fair. It's based on hard work. For Marxists, it's not fair. It's based on which class you're in. And for feminists as well, it's not fair. It's based on what gender you are, basically. So we're now going to take a bit of a deeper look into the functionist view of stratification. I'm going to kind of mention a few things here, but effectively go over what I've just said, but in a bit more detail. So I'm going to leave that strata, that hierarchy up on the right hand side there, so just to remind yourself that ultimately, for functionists, society is stratified according to, to meritocracy or to hard work. So what they really say is that we need stratification in society and that we need it because we need society to be to work well to be functional and also for it to be fair so in that way for functionists they would argue that society needs to be meritocratic and they would argue it is meritocratic and it needs to be based on this equality of opportunity so that everybody gets the same chance of doing well and getting those rewards of status and wealth and money but the ultimately it's down to how hard you decide to work in order to get as far up that ladder as you want. And don't forget as well, we've got this thing called uh, social mobility, which is the ability to move, here's my, my ladder again, to move between those different rung, uh, rungs in that ladder or that strata. So one of the important things that you'll need to know about functionists, functionists are always positive about anything. So everything in society is functional. It holds a positive function. And poverty is no different. Now you might think, well, that's weird. Poverty is like, people being really poor and like not having much and how can that be a good thing for society well according to functionists it's good because it motivates people into working harder so the argument would be basically if you see someone who is in poverty is homeless for instance you don't look at that person and think wow I'd love to be in your position you look at that person and feel pity or you feel sorry for them or you think wow I'm glad I'm not in that position so for functionists poverty fulfills that function basically of reminding people that they don't want to end up like that it motivates them to work harder so that they can get higher up that ladder that hierarchy that strata and ultimately not end up in poverty now what also is another thing that functionists would say is that inequality is also good we need inequality because if we didn't have inequality in society then society would be based on equality of outcome where everybody gets the same and there's no emphasis or impetus to work hard so you need to have this inequality and what ultimately they mean by that is that some people have certain lots of things and some people have little and the reason that is is because people work hard so you need that inequality because otherwise society would not be based on hard work and it wouldn't be based on meritocracy so that's two things that sound sort of like paradoxical it doesn't sound like it makes sense but for functionists poverty and inequality are both functional things in their system of stratification now Let's try and add in a couple of sociologists to this as well. We're going to throw in here Parsons. Now, really, Parsons is the guy, the functionist, who says that society works on the basis of meritocracy, i.e. everyone having an equal chance of success and that hard work gets rewarded. So that's one of the sociologists you want to bring in if you're ever talking about the impact of uh, society being a meritocracy and the strata being meritocratic talk about Parsons because he's ultimately the person you want to attribute to this idea that society is a meritocracy. So let's have a look then now at another couple of functionists that you may remember from the education unit. They are Davis and Moore. Now what Davis and Moore say, how you can tie this into um, 
the functions view of stratification is that society is based on role allocation. Now, what <clears throat> excuse me, what role allocation means is that the best jobs or the best roles, if you will, are given to those that work hardest for them. So this works in school. So if you remind yourself back to the education unit, we argued that you know the people that end up in the best jobs are ultimately the people who are the most talented and who work hard at different disciplines. So for instance, if you are good at English and you work hard at English, the chances are you're going to be a journalist. If you're not very good at maths, the chances are you're not going to end up training to be an accountant, that kind of thing. So society sort of sorts and sifts you into particular roles based on what you're good at and what you work hard at. And ultimately, for Davis and Moore, they would say that the, the best jobs or ultimately the jobs that give you the most money or the most rewards in society are given to those who work the hardest for them. And I'll give you a, a, just a brief example about this. So you may or may not know that the, the sort of I'm sure doctors would argue about this at the moment with their strikes and stuff. But doctors and lawyers are generally paid a fairly decent wage. And for, for that, what I'm basically talking about is, you know, on or around £100,000 plus. And the reason that those guys get paid so much is because they need to work the hardest, in, or using the function sphere at least, need to work the hardest in order to get there. So someone like me, I went to university for three years and then did an extra year to train to become a teacher. So I've trained for four years to become a teacher. To become a lawyer or a doctor, you need to train for at least seven years, which means that they get high salaries because they've had to ultimately spend a lot of their own money on their uh, tuition fees, on getting trained, and ultimately probably haven't been very rich for, for that time. So it's only fair that they get paid a, a decent amount of money in, in, in return for the work and the training that they've put in. If you contrast that with someone like a retail worker, so someone who just works in the shop, you don't have to study to get that. You don't have to go to university or, to, or get a special degree in order to do that. But of course, the, the, the rewards for those jobs tend to be lower. So they tend to be minimum wage jobs if you work at a, a checkout or behind the till in the shop, that kind of thing. So what Davis and Moore are saying is that the role allocation plays this function of ensuring that the people who work the hardest get the best jobs, get the highest status, get the biggest rewards and the most salary in order for those people, those jobs to be worth the extra work that people put in to get them. I hope that kind of makes sense. So there we go. Before we move on, what I want you to do now is just have a think while I take a brief sip of coffee is what or how might you criticise the functionist view of stratification? Around? There is problems with this system. Can you think of any ways that you might be able to criticise it? Now, I'm going to show you a couple of criticisms for it. Firstly, is society really that meritocratic? If you have been following the previous videos, you will be aware that actually in terms of things like education and, and education and achievement, there are big differences between social groups. It's not necessarily down to meritocracy. For instance, are there uh, material or cultural inequalities between classes? Do we have things like racism and institutional racism in terms of different ethnic groups, those kind of things? So is society really that meritocratic? Is it all about how hard you work? Because if it really was, then there are certain people who work, for instance, like three minimum wage jobs, who work incredibly hard, who probably work, you know, for 15, six, maybe even 15 hours a day, and who cannot get themselves out of poverty. So we've got lots of people who work at the moment, one, two, even three, maybe even more jobs, who cannot get themselves out of poverty. So clearly, it can't be about how hard you work, because clearly there's something else going on there. And also, if you think about certain people who have ascribed status, so they are born into certain wealthy positions, for instance, you are the, the, uh, the, the son or daughter of someone who owns a huge business empire, the chances are that you're not going to have to work that hard in order to uh, get a role in that business. Or you could just think about the king and the queen and those kind of things in the royal family. You know, they end up being very rich, very high status. What work do they ever have to do? Not much. They just have to be born into those families. So there's some little things there you might want to think about in terms of criticisms, and they're going to become important as I move towards the end of this video. So a quick cup of coffee, first of all. And then we'll move on to have a look at the Marxist view. Sorry, we're not going to have a look at the Marxist view. We're going to have a look at the new right view very quickly. And the reason I'm going to do the new right view, I'm only going to cover this very swiftly, is because they basically take the functionist arguments further. So one of the main people you're going to need to know, or rather the only main person you'll need to know when it comes to the new right, 
and stratification is a guy called Peter Saunders. And Peter Saunders basically follows the argument of functionalists that you need stratification in order for society to work as well as possible. Now, the difference with Saunders and with the new right to the functionalists is that they take it one step further. So they say, we absolutely 100% need to give these unequal rewards, so the incredibly high salaries to those who work at the top level of their jobs, so, you know, a top lawyer or a top doctor or a top surgeon or something like that, ultimately because they've worked the hardest to get them. Now, you might think, well, okay, that makes sense. But what Saunders then says is that this basically incentivizes and encourages everyone to strive for those top paying jobs. So you're thinking, I don't know, sat, you're sat there, you're 16, 17 or whatever, and you're thinking, what job would I like to do? I want a job that's going to pay me lots of money. Well, you look down the list of jobs that pay the best money. According to Saunders, he would say that because lawyers, doctors, whoever get paid the most, this is going to encourage you to go for those jobs because you can get the most rewards from them. However, this is where it gets a bit weird because Saunders ultimately says that there is almost like this natural reason why the middle classes have the best jobs. He argues, whether you agree with this or not is up to you, but he would argue that the middle classes are basically naturally more clever than the working classes and that they work harder than the rest of society, which is why you tend to find middle class people being lawyers and doctors and you don't tend to see that many working class people there. So I'll leave you to debate whether you believe that or not. Again, with this stuff, you don't have to buy into this. Like, I'll be honest with you, I don't buy into that at all. But what I would say is you do need to understand it if you want to write about the new right argument. However, there are lots of problems with this. Number one, Let's think about why the, mid the middle classes really are at the top of society. Well, ultimately, it's because they've got material and cultural advantages. So they've got things like extra money already. If you come from a rich family, your rich family can support you through money and encouragement, uh, giving you experiences, even talking to you in certain ways, will be able to put you further up that social strata. If we take the feminist argument, well, they would say that this whole thing about like people who work the hardest get to the top is a lot of old rubbish because... According to feminists, women often are excluded from the top jobs in society. So, for instance, CEOs, there's this issue called the glass ceiling that feminists would argue uh, they can see the top jobs in society, but they cannot smash through this glass ceiling because ultimately it's controlled by men and men won't let women get to the top in certain positions. And then finally, <clears throat> we want to be thinking also about whether the best paying jobs are ultimately the really the most important in society. So if you think of the classically really, really high paying job, you think of a Premier League footballer who's on, you know, somewhere between, I guess, 100,000 to 500,000 pounds a week. That's, that's a huge amount of money. Is kicking a ball, I mean, I'm a football fan, but is kicking a ball about really the most kind of important job in society? I don't think it is. It's good. It's fun. I enjoy football as much as the next person but it's not as important as a surgeon or a doctor, is it? Let's be honest. And also vice versa. So if you think about nurses, teachers, you know, these police, fire uh, professionals, these people tend not to get particularly high wages. Carers, another good example, but they are incredibly important people for society. We need these people for society work. So really, have we got society and stratification around the right way? Are we really paying the best people in the most important jobs, the highest salary, I'd argue we're probably not, and there's probably a bit of a dis uh, disconnect there between those things. So that's the functionist view. That's the new right view I've just taken you through. And you can add the new right on almost as like a bit of analysis if you're writing about the functionist view as well. OK, so let's have a look at the Marxist view. What do the Marxists say about stratification? As I mentioned at the start of this video, they would stratify society according to a class-based system. And for Marx, he makes it really simple. He says there are just two social classes. You've got the bourgeoisie who own stuff and they have the power and you have the proletariat who don't own stuff. They do not have the power. What they have to do is work for the bourgeoisie in order to survive. So as I mentioned, you've got this class-based system that's based on the bourgeoisie who are the middle class or the ruling class and the proletariat who are the working class or the labourers in a capitalist system. Now, because the uh, bourgeoisie are on the top, the reason they are at the top is because they own things. They own particularly property, which ultimately we're not talking about, oh, you know, this pen is my property. Yes, it is, but property that can make you profit. So it's like a business or some land or some property that you can profit from. And they're the things that really, according to Marx, characterise that middle class, that bourgeoisie. They are people who own things. Now, um, 
the middle classes own stuff, but the working classes don't. What do the working classes do in order to sort of make their money? They have to sell their labor to the middle classes and work in their factories or the work for their businesses in order to survive. So according to Marx, it's a very different kind of view that he takes as opposed to functionists, because ultimately he would say that stratification is not only unequal, it's unfair, and that poverty is the result of that inequality and that in unequalness and that unfairness in society. So let's just very briefly compare that with the functionalist view who say that um, stratification is needed. Poverty and inequality are fair, they are equal. We need those, they encourage people to work harder. According to Marx, it's just a byproduct of living in a capitalist system. So let's go a little bit deeper. So who do you wanna be talking about? If you're writing a an answer on the Marxist view of stratification, well, Karl Marx is always a good start. So here's a couple of key words, and I've, I've tried to, all the way through this. Like you probably noticed this already, I should have mentioned it earlier, but I've tried all the way through this to put sort of the key words and the key ideas in yellow as we go through this. So according to Marx, he would argue that the middle class, the bourgeoisie own the means of production. That's just his word for something, a, a piece of property that can make you profit, like a factory, for instance. So to see means of production as factories. And those factories can exploit the working classes into those low paying jobs, maximizing the profit for themselves at the expense of the poor. Now, what we're getting at here is Marx is talking about the fact that the middle classes will always try to maximize as much profit as they can from their businesses. So whatever their factory is producing they will try to keep their costs low so they will pay their workers as little as possible and and keep their profits nice and high so they're going to try and pay their workers as low as possible not so little that they can't turn up for work and die because that's not good because they need someone to work in the factories but not too much so that the working class potentially start to save and own their own means of production you want to keep it just about right so that they can earn enough money to live to keep coming to work but not enough money to actually be able to start their own means of production so ultimately it's the poor and the proletariat that lose out here but it's not just about having the most money, according to Marx. Now, he would argue that the people who do have the most money and the most status, the bourgeoisie in society, they use their position at the top of that strata to basically solidify where they are. So what they do is they use their power to put forward ideas into, the, uh, into society, sort of things like the idea that it's natural that the, that the middle classes do better or, or there must be someone in charge all the time or that greed is good, these kind of ideas. And they try to justify why there are inequalities in other parts of society. So they will put forward what Marx calls an ideology. That's just basically pushing forward ideas to make people think certain things. Like, for instance, oh, it's not so bad that I'm poor because there is uh, benefits available. Or it's not so bad that I'm poor because probably I didn't work hard enough. Or it's not so bad that I'm poor because um, I didn't try hard enough in school. This is what Marx refers to as false class consciousness and if I can try and like just break that down a little bit for you false class consciousness means that the working classes don't know how bad their position in society is so for instance you know um companies will do things like they will give you uh little perks and benefits like they won't pay you more money but they will give you like some free health insurance why do they give you free health insurance because they want to make sure that you're well enough to turn up to work every day and make more profit for them so false class consciousness is the idea that the working class aren't are basically tricked or duped into not realizing how bad their position in society is mark said that if they would realize that they would ultimately all get together the working class and they would overthrow capitalism because they've had enough of it and they continue to get exploited by it but that hasn't actually happened yet on the topic on the on the topic of capitalism it's a complicated thing um I, what i'd suggest if you're not quite sure what capitalism is i'm going to go through it very briefly with you there's a lovely little instagram post i did a couple of years ago called the simple guide to capitalism go and have a look at that if you can that will hopefully explain it to you but in, in a nutshell what capitalism is it's an economic system it's a way that money works around the world and what it's all about is getting as much profit as you can and you get as much profit as you can through owning private things for oh, private ownership of property businesses houses land factories those kind of things so the idea of capitalism is the aim of the game is to make as much money as you can but there's no real end point to it now for marx 
and Marxists, they would say that one of the big problems with the capitalist society or the way that society is stratified onto capitalist lines is because the class inequalities are getting much, much worse as we go through uh, the years from when Marx was writing about 150, 200 years ago. So ultimately what we mean by this is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The more um, the, 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 the people with the most in society, what some people sometimes refer to as the 1%, are getting smaller, but their wealth is getting richer, and the rest of us are getting collectively poorer. So this is the problem, according to Marx, for, for stratifying society in that two-class system. And as I mentioned, that Marx was thinking that ultimately the working classes would figure this out once they get over this sense of false class consciousness, they would work this out, realise they're getting screwed over, and that they would all rise up and revolt, come together and overthrow uh, communism, excuse me, overthrow capitalism with communism, which is a system which is based on no private ownership of profit making entities. So you won't own, no one will own factories, it will all be collectively owned and any profit generated from that gets shared amongst everybody because everybody owns it rather than getting all the profit just to one person. So Marx thought that that would be a fairer system. However, and there is always going to be however with this and keep, keep in mind, keep your mind's eye on this as we come to look at a question on this later on. First and foremost, you could argue, you know, is capitalism really that bad? You know, things have actually improved quite significantly since Marx was writing. For instance, our life expectancy is significantly higher now than it was, uh, you know, 100 to 200 years ago, for instance. So capitalism has actually done an awful lot of good in the world. It's not a perfect system, but is it actually as bad as Marx is making out? The second thing is, uh, Marxists very much argue against that functionist view that, that society is based on meritocracy. Marxists would say that meritocracy is a myth, it's a lie, it's something made up as part of false class consciousness to make us believe that if we work hard we will do well. But is it really a load of old rubbish? Because actually, generally speaking, people who do work the hardest do end up doing better in society than those that don't. The final thing to say is that Marx was wrong about communism. Marx thought that eventually all of the workers would figure this all out, they would get together, they would revolt and replace capitalism with a communist system. That hasn't yet happened in the places that Marx said it would have done. Now, it has happened in certain places, and that communist experiment has, uh, to a certain extent, not gone as well as perhaps you would theorise it would have done. So there's a few criticisms there to level at the Marxist views of stratification. Now, we are well through like, the main bit of this, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to cover off some of the key terms that I've looked at in this video with you so far. Just to remind you, we've looked at the functionist view, the new right view, and the Marxist view of stratification. So, first and foremost, stratification, what is it? It's a way of layering society or putting groups in society into layers. For example, the functionist base is stratification on the hardest workers, versus the non-hardest workers. Marx bases it on the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and feminists base it on uh, men and women. So stratification is just a way of splitting society up into layers. Inequality. What does inequality mean? It means there are differences between how people are treated and what people get in society. So again, we're thinking there about the haves and the have-nots. According to Marx, the haves who are the bourgeoisie, the have-nots are the proletariat. According to functionists, the people who have stuff are the people who work the hardest, and the people who don't have stuff are the people who don't work hard and end up in poverty. A long way through this, I've been talking about, you know, hard work gets rewards. What do we mean by rewards? We ultimately mean wealth and status so wealth is kind of what you have based on the collection of money and any assets you might have status is how you're seen in society so think back to how perhaps a doctor is seen versus how a cleaner is seen as their level of importance in society a functionist word meritocracy basic meritocracy is based on two things it's the idea that everyone in, in society has a equal chance of doing well so you all get an equal chance of success or equality of opportunity and secondly that hard work gets rewarded so that if you all start off with the same uh, opportunities it's up to you as to what you do with those opportunities and how hard you work and how hard you get those things to take you further up the strata meritocracy incidentally an argument or a concept very much associated with talker parsons then we looked at role allocation so 
Davis and Moore's idea of role allocation. How does that tie into stratification? It's basically about how hard you work and how talented you are at particular sort of things, whether that be, think in terms of like school subjects. And ultimately, if you're talented and you work hard at a particular thing, say art or maths or science or whatever, you're going to get a role or a job in that field later on down the line. So it's like this, isn't it? You know, as you go through your school career, you get gradually more specialised in things. So, you know, before you take your GCSEs, you're doing a bunch more subjects and you narrow it down a little bit. Once you've done your GCSEs, you go down to A levels and you do like three or four subjects. Then you'll go out down to um, a degree or something and only look at one subject. And then after that, if you do a master's or a PhD, you might be looking at one tiny part of one greater subject. So this is what role allocation is. It's sorting and sifting the right people into the right roles. How do we make sure that the right people end up as doctors and lawyers and the people who get paid the most? It's the people who put the most effort in and train hardest for those jobs. So seven years at a minimum to become a lawyer or a doctor in the UK. Moving on to some of the Marxist sort of concepts and terms, capitalism. Capitalism is an economic system that most of the world runs on. It's based on two things, really. It's based on profit and pursuing profit and the ownership of private property that's what capitalism is it's about making as much money as you can through the ownership of things that can make you profit how do you make profit ultimately you need something that you can produce at a low cost and you can sell at a higher cost how can you keep those costs low you pay your workers as low as you possibly can Marx talked about a two-tier system in terms of stratification between the proletariat the proletariat are the poor or the working class, sometimes referred to the labouring classes. They're the people who don't own any private property. So what do they own? All they own is their ability to work, their labour. So they sell that back to the capitalists or the bourgeoisie who own those factories, those means of production. Bourgeoisie, also known as the rich or the ruling classes, they are the owners of the means of production. They own the factories. They therefore can employ some of the proletariat to work in those factories for a poor wage so that they can increase their profits all the time and make as much money as they possibly can. That's what capitalism is all about. Means of production is a factory or something that can make you profit. So it could even be that you're a landlord and that you rent a house out or that you own some land and that you rent that land out to a farmer or something like that. Again, what you've got is something, a means of production makes you profit. And finally, the word I'm going to just finish up on here is exploitation. Marx would argue that the capitalists, the bourgeoisie or the ruling class, whatever term you want to use, and we'll find them in the same thing, exploit the proletariat because they pay them as little as possible and much lower than the actual value of the work that they are putting in to produce whatever it is, tables or chairs or, or sociology mugs or whatever they might be. By the way, these are produced in entirely equal fair conditions by my fair hands not really by my fair hands by someone else but made in the uk so there you go so there we go there's 10 key terms there that have come up throughout this video i hope those kind of make sense all that's really left for me to do now is kind of just go through and have a little word on the exams for you so this is the part where if you take the GCSE Educas or wjc course listen up this is directly relevant to you if you don't it doesn't mean that you can't take anything from this it just means that if you're taking an exam this summer, the questions will look different to this. They'll be uh, worth different amount of marks and all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to take you through it, assuming that you probably do do the Educast spec. So um, what you need to know, W-Y-N-T-K, rolls off the tongue, that one, doesn't it? Extractive is a bloody big topic in paper two. It's made up of seven sections, the whole entire paper, and extractive topics are comprised in sections three, four, and five. Now, if you look at how many marks that's made up of, it's 49 marks. The whole paper is made out of 100. So extractive is effectively half of the marks on this paper. So it's a very big part of this paper. Now, the kinds of questions you'll get asked to answer are going to be two markers, four markers. You might get the occasional five marker in there, but also nine mark questions. Nine mark questions are the biggest question that you will have to answer in the stratif part of the paper. Now, I'm going to go through one of these with you. And this is a very typical, in fact, this was a is this 2020, I think, a 2020 question from uh, paper two from the GCC Educast spec. So the question reads, functionists and Marxists have similar views on stratification. Do you agree with this view? I'm going to give you a moment. It'd be a good idea, actually, if you are taking this exam to pause the video now and have a think about 
how you might answer that question. Have a think about some of the stuff that I've gone through uh, this video and talked about. What are the kind of key terms you need to bring in? Are there any sociologists? Ultimately, do they have the similar view? So if you want to pause it now, pause it, have a think about yourself. I'm going to take you through a very quick plan, and then I'm going to show you my answer for this question. So my very quick plan would be something like this. Your, 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 your answers to this question should be about a page, maybe. You want a really quick introductory sentence, and your introductory sentence is, no, they don't have similar views on stratification. Then what you're going to need to do is write a paragraph about the functions view. So what do they say? you will need to evaluate it. Now, what that means is you will need to criticise it or you will need to analyse it and show a bit of a deeper understanding of those arguments. I'm going to show you how you do that in a minute, but it's very important you evaluate it because you get three out of the nine marks for your evaluation in this question. You're also going to need a paragraph on Marxist to sort of uh, compare the functionist view. Same thing with that. Think about key terms. What do they say? Who is the key person to talk about there? And again, you're going to need to evaluate. You're going to need to criticise it. How could you perhaps give a counter view to the Marxist argument? Now, even if you write the best uh, nine mark essay in the world and you don't write a conclusion, you will not hit nine out of nine. You must write a conclusion if you want to get nine out of nine. And your, shoot, your conclusion needs to be short, perhaps maybe a sentence, possibly two sentences. But again, you need to answer the question. It's the same as the introduction. No, they don't share the same views and stratification. They are very, very different. So let's have a look at how I've gone about answering this question. And like this isn't necessarily, certainly not the only way to answer this question. It's certainly not a perfect answer. But having Mark for the GCSE examining board, I would be pretty confident that I would give this answer a nine out of nine and not just because it's mine. But let's have a look at what I've written here. So Marxists and functionists have similar views of stratification. Do you agree with this view? My introduction is really simple. Look, one sentence. The reason it's one sentence, you don't really, you're not really going to get many marks for your introduction, but you need to set out where you're going. So functionists and Marxists do not have similar views about stratification. In fact, they differ greatly. That answers the question. I've now got to go into my functionist paragraph and explain why the functionists see it the way they do. So for functionists, society is stratified according to a meritocratic system where those who work hardest are rewarded and those who don't are not. This leaves them suggesting that inequality and poverty is a functional, positive thing in society because it acts as a motivation for people to work hard and put effort into their lives. Davis and Moore argue that we are allocated roles in life according to how much effort and training we are prepared to put into them. For example, becoming a doctor takes seven years of training, so only those willing to put in this work should be rewarded with the states and salary that comes with being a doctor. However, this is my criticism, this is my evaluation, it's a really important part of this. However, the functionist view could be criticised for suggesting that society is meritocratic with everyone having equality of opportunity. This is clearly not the case when looking at the role of class, gender or ethnicity and how that plays a role in people's life chances. There we go. Paragraph two, <clears throat> excuse me, is the Marxist paragraph. So Marxists, on the other hand, would argue that society is stratified according to class lines and that meritocracy is a myth in society. Karl Marx suggests that society is stratified between the rich bourgeoisie ruling classes and the poor proletariat working classes. The ruling classes own the means of production or factories and are able to create great profits by selling commodities. A commodity is just a thing um, that can be sold. Uh, commodities made through exploiting the labour of the working classes for the lowest possible wage. This is known as capitalist exploitation. The proletariat are kept in their position in the social strata through having enough money to live and go to work, but never enough to buy their own means of production, thereby continuing the way that society is stratified, serving the interests of the ruling classes. However, so again, this is my criticism here, this is an important part. However, Marx was writing well over 100 years ago. And since then, there have been many examples of people who have broken out of their social strata through starting their own businesses from scratch, Lord Alan Sugar being one obvious example. In conclusion, functionists and Marxists do not have similar views on social stratification. Functionists see the social strata as fair and just, whereas Marxists see it as unfair and as the result of class inequalities that would only be removed once capitalism is overthrown. There we go. So that answer, uh, I would give that a nine out of nine. What you've got in there really is you've got for each of the main paragraphs, you've got a sociologist. So for, uh, for excuse me, functionists, you've got Davidson Moore. For, for Marxism, you've got Marx. I've just peppered it full of key terms as well. So things like inequality, poverty, functional, motivation, uh, role allocation. I'm just studying it here. Rewards, 
Uh, and I've also given a criticism to each, each of those um, arguments as well. So that bit, however, you can see there with my cursor and there, however, it's only a sentence, maybe two sentences, but it's super, super important to get in if you want to be looking towards the maximum marks. And as I say, like you've got to kind of throw a conclusion in there if you want to be getting nine out of nine, you have to be able to conclude your little mini essay. Now, if you're looking at a kind of guidance as to how long you should spend on that, it's about a mark a minute. So nine marks should take you about nine or 10 minutes. Although to be honest, given that some of your <clears throat> one or two mark questions won't take you one or two minutes, you might be able to sort of build up a bank of time that might give you 10, 11 minutes on those kind of questions. So there you go. That's just a bit of a, a nine mark question, that very common on different theories of stratification. So uh, we'll just come to the end of this. I'll just rerun back through what I've done with you today. So we looked at the functionalist view of stratification, particularly focusing on Parsons' idea of meritocracy and Davis and Moore's concept of role allocation. We looked at the new right very briefly, mentioning Peter Saunders and how he thinks that the middle classes are naturally clever and almost certainly work harder than the working classes, which explains why they're in their position in society. The Marxist view, very different to the functionist and the new right view. They would say that society is stratified according to class lines based on the, uh, the, the distinction between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and that ultimately the bourgeoisie own the means of production, which means they can exploit the working class proletariat. Then we went through some key terms from the video. I've just finished off by doing an exam question, a nine mark exam question, comparing the Marxist and the functionist views of stratification and explaining why they do not share the same views on strat. So there we go. Um, my uh, time here is done. Hopefully that is uh, going to be useful for you. Sorry, it's gone on for a little bit longer than I would have liked it to have done, but Hopefully, uh, you know, you'll be aware that sometimes these things do need a little bit of explanation and sometimes I'm hoping that it will just be a little bit easier for you if I take you through things rather than skimming over things and stuff like that. So I'm going to sign off in a minute, but before I do, just a couple of quick uh, bits of housekeeping. If you have enjoyed this video or let me explain, rephrase that, if you've found something useful from this video, if you liked it, you've uh, in, you've got something that's taught you something, do us a favour, just whack a like on it, put a subscription onto my channel, that'd be massively helpful. Go back and have a look at some of my previous videos as well. So I've done loads of stuff on paper one, uh, family, education, methods, etc. Uh, there's going to be more of these videos coming out. So do keep an eye on them. You might well want to just put a notification on your subscription because there'll be quite a few coming out over the next sort of days, weeks and months of this. Um, and also, if you uh, want to, you can support me by going and visiting my Patreon page, which is also all sociology. It's uh, patreon.com slash all sociology. So you can go there and pledge uh, to basically buy me a cup of coffee or buy me a pint, whatever you prefer. You don't have to, that's fine. A like is just as appreciated. Um, and also, if you haven't already, you can follow me on all of the socials. Uh, well, I say all the socials, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I am on TikTok, but the likelihood of me ever doing anything on TikTok, pretty low, I would have thought. But we'll have to see. Uh, once again, any comments, any questions, whack them in the chat. If not, I will see you again next time. This is the worst outro to any video ever, but I'll see you again next time when I'm going to take you through some views of Max Weber and what he said about stratification. Anyway, until next time, I'll see you later. Take it easy. Bye.